So this is the first part of the diversity and extinction lecture. And before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to work on your concept map. Um, they really work most effectively if you're consistent and you keep up with them every week. Because as you've probably noticed, we keep coming back to some of the same ideas and concepts um, as we add more topics and more information over the course of the semester. And so the concept map is a really great way to organize all of that together and to keep track of the connections and links that we'll be making as we move through the course. So, so far in class, we've talked about the nature of the fossil record, evolution, growth, and development of organisms. We had our couple of weeks where we did a brief overview of the history of life on Earth. Uh, and then we've talked about functional morphology and we'll be doing functional morphology um, in lab on Wednesday this week as well. So where we're we going? Um, we're moving towards the second part of the course now, where we'll be talking more about trends and patterns. And I really wanted to share this quote um, from a recent paper by the paleontologist Doug Irwin that says, historical sciences become more than narratives when they identify general patterns and regularities in mechanism from similarities among historically unique events. So basically what Doug's trying to say here is that instead of just saying this happened, then this happened, then this happened, we can look at patterns um, and mechanisms among these events and try to look for commonalities, look for patterns, look for trends, and try to understand why these events happened, when and how they did, as opposed to just documenting that they happened. So um, this unit is going to consist of Thursday of this week and then Tuesday after spring break. So we'll be talking about diversity um, mostly today and long-term trends. Then we'll be discussing uh, mass extinctions uh, the following week. And then the, the paper that we'll be reading for Thursday bridges with these, these two a little bit by talking about um, selectivity of background versus mass extinctions over the course of the Phanerozoic. But today we'll be mostly focusing on diversity. So why do we care about diversity? So diversity tells us something about how biological systems are operating at any given time. Are things diversifying and becoming more species? Are more species being created? Are, or, or, excuse me, or are species being uh, destroyed? Are they going extinct? Um, <coughs> it's relatively easy to measure compared to some of the other things we might wanna know about in the fossil record. Changes in diversity help us identify intervals of geologic time that are of particular interest, and the history of biodiversity helps us see how we arrived at the biota, which currently inhabits our planet. Okay, so what is diversity and how should we measure it? So it turns out this is actually a really complicated question. Um, take a second and just think about this to yourself right now. When we say diversity, what do we mean? Um, and then how should we go about and measure it? Obviously, if we were in class, we would be doing this in small groups, but just take a second to yourself right now and think about it. Um, when we say diversity, what do we actually mean and how should we measure it? Okay, so you've had a second to talk, think about it a little bit. We'll get into the details. So what do we mean when we say diversity? It turns out there's actually a lot of different ways to think and talk about diversity. The first is alpha diversity, which is diversity within a single ecosystem. This is also often called species richness. Uh, the other kind of diversity, which may have been the diversity that occurred to you first is beta diversity, or excuse me, gamma diversity is total global diversity, which is probably what you thought of. Um, there's also beta diversity, which is a measure of difference. So how many species are unique uh, to two or more ecosystems that we're measuring? And then gamma diversity is total global diversity, which is probably the most straightforward way of thinking about diversity um, over time, like how many things are there on the planet at any given moment. Turns out that all three of them are really important for understanding um, trends and that each of them gives us information uh, that the others can't. So I'm just going to discuss um, a little bit more about these three using this little cartoon here. So we've got three different sites, A, B, and C. You can think of them as representing three different ecosystems, and the little colored shapes in each one represent uh, different species. So site A has seven species, B has five, and C has seven. 
So alpha diversity is the richness of individuals within a hab habitat unit. So the alpha diversity of site A is 7, site B is 5, and site C is 7. So what about beta diversity? Beta diversity is the difference between habitats. So in the example below, the greatest beta diversity is between A and C because they have 10 species that are different. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and only two that are in common, these two right here. So gamma diversity would be sort of global or landscape diversity. Um, and in this example, the gamma diversity of all three habitats um, is 12 species of total diversity. So there's 12 different shapes here. So that's the vocabulary here between alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so how do we actually measure diversity? This again is actually a pretty complicated question. Um, we're also going to be talking about this in lab after spring break. Um, so I'll be touching on some of the major points now, but we'll be coming back to this question again during lab. Okay, so let's say we have a timeline. Um, each one of these um, black lines here represents uh, the range of a fossil species. Okay, so we have, um, sorry for these boxes. So we have the ranges, the first appearance and last appearance of all of these taxa. So the beginning of each line represents where the taxon originates and the end represents where it goes extinct. So then we can create time bins. So um, the blue lines represent time bins and then we can add up how many lines in, are in each time bin. So this one has three, this one has one, two, three, four. We could add up our numbers at the bottom and then we can create um, uh, a, a basically a point uh, graph of those numbers for each bin. So here um, we have just a quick um, within bin measure of diversity. And remember that in general, diversity is the net product of origination and extinction. So new species originate or appear and other species go extinct and that's how we end up with diversity. So making a traditional diversity curve, again, you take the first and last known occurrences for each taxon, um, these serve as approximations of the true times of origination and extinction, and then you basically just add up your diversity. So there are some issues with this, and there's lots of different ways that people have gotten around some of these issues. The textbook, uh, I think, talks about this a little bit, and again, we'll talk more about it in lab. One of them is the boundary crossing method. So here we only count taxa that cross a boundary, i.e. that exist before and after the boundary. So only taxa that are in at least two time bins. So if we go back to our little figure here, this taxon here would not be counted because it never crosses a boundary. These two would. So it's almost like we're counting at the lines instead of within the bins when we're doing boundary crossing. So what issues does this method get around? Um, it might be hard for you to come up with ideas on your own, but think about it for just a second, um, and we'll come back to this in, uh, in lecture and in, uh, in lab as well. So think about what issues does the method of boundary crossing um, get around versus our regular, uh, regular just counting within bins. So one of the things that it does get around, which is pretty important, is that you're guaranteed the coexistence of taxa. So if we come back up here, um, I don't really have a good example actually in this figure, which is annoying. Uh, so basically imagine like you have this guy here, right? Um, and then he goes extinct and then you have another one that uh, originates right afterwards. So you would count the diversity in this bin as as being two, but those two taxa never actually exist at the same time. Um, and so actually, let me just like here, I'll just do a little on the fly edit here so you can see what I'm talking about. So let's see, we have these two lineages here. Okay, so these two lineages here um, are within the same bin but they never actually coexist. If we were to count the diversity in here, it would, it would be four, um, but only these three taxa actually coexist at the same time, um, and, and these two taxa. If we just count boundary crossers, which would be three for this boundary here, then we get around that problem. Um, and we know that all of the species that we're counting at the boundary uh, actually existed at the same exact time. We often call these uh, singletons, taxa that only are found in one time bin, and singletons often get dumped from the 
um, the record for lots of reasons. They can create a lot of artificial biases in our, in our measures. Okay, so there's many ways to measure diversity. Um, here, A is showing a standard method with all data included. B is showing just boundary crossing, uh, which you can see is a little bit different. And the total numbers are a little lower. Um, C is the st standard mes method with those singletons excluded. And D is the standard method with recent occurrences uh, ignored. And I'll explain a little bit more about why we might want to get rid of recent occurrences uh, a little bit later. And we'll also talk about this more in lab. Okay, so now we have some idea about how we actually go out and measure diversity. Uh, what does Phanerozoic marine diversity look like and why? And so that's what we'll get to uh, next. <laughs>